This is episode number 31, featuring artist Rose Schering from Holland. Welcome to the Plen Air Podcast from Plen Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. In the Plen Air Podcast, we dig into the world of outdoor painting called Plen Air Painting. For those that don't know, Plen Air is a term, French term essentially meaning outdoors or the open air. The French say Plen Air, others say Plain Air, it doesn't matter what you say. What matters is there's a huge movement of artists around the world who love going outdoors to paint, and this show is all about the movement, the painters, the collectors, the galleries, the art. This week's podcast brought to you by the Plein Air Convention, which is the largest gathering of plein air artists in history. It's coming this April in San Diego. You can learn more at pleinairconvention.com. And if you're listening before Thanksgiving, the price goes up on Black Friday. So you want to sign up now, especially because it's about 88% sold out. It's my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting. It's changed my life. It'll change yours. It's a lot of fun. You can help by sharing the podcast with your friends on social media or email. And I hope you'll subscribe and leave a comment on iTunes about the show. And if you have feedback, contact me, Eric, at plenairmagazine.com. This interview brought to you by Easel Brush Clip, the cool tool for your studio or your outdoor easel. Easelbrushclip.com. You can see their video. Let's get right to the interview with Rose Schering. Well, I'm honored to have Rose Schering on the the line. And um, Rose is is spelled R-O-O-S. Is that the proper pronunciation in Holland? Is it Rose? Yeah, it is rose because it's the same meaning, the flower. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Rose, why don't you tell everybody where it is that you are at the moment, where you live? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Rose Schuring. That's how I pronounce it. But uh, it's fine that people call me Ruse, like uh, the kangaroos. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm living in Holland. That's the Netherlands. We have the main capital, Amsterdam. That's maybe familiar. And uh, that's about it. And do you do you smoke a lot of pot over there? Uh, I used to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just legalized here in America six different six new states. Mm, yeah, but there's a downside to the legalization as well, huh? Yeah, I suppose so. Uh, well, listen. Uh, one of the things I want to uh, touch on is uh, plein air painting in Europe, and uh, I'm curious about that. So, we'll we'll get. Um, well, why don't we just go right into that for a second? You know, I, I know that the plein air movement is huge in America. Uh, yeah. What's it like in your area of, of uh, around Amsterdam and in Holland? Is mm-hmm. there, uh, are there a lot of people who are doing plein air painting? Um, I think it was more of a movement back in the days. So uh, about 100 years ago, Holland was famous for... Uh, for uh, its plein air painters and um, the natural colors, the Dutch landscape, the water everywhere reflecting, gray skies, uh, the sheep in the fields, maybe cows, windmills, etc. Today, yeah, maybe it's different. There are more abstract painters here. Right. Mm -hmm. So how is it that uh, you became a plein air painter? Uh, I always loved the uh, yeah the wide open view, uh, the meadow here everywhere. Um, I think I never imagined to be anything else but a landscape painter, uh, especially clouds and skies interest me. And yeah, uh, uh, luckily um, I joined a uh, plein air. Um, thing uh, on the beach uh, 10 years ago and um, that's how it became a living or um, a choice within painting so there were there was something plein air out there that you had access yeah. to so are, are there yeah. still uh, are you, do you have uh, a number of local painters 
Um, yeah, but Holland is a small country. So if I if you ask me to name ten, I probably could, but not more. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And there probably are more, but they just not are not visible. Yeah, it's different. Well, uh, you and I had a really great time together. It was about a year ago. Um, at, at yes. From the time we're recording this, uh, we went out to to uh, Zan. How do you pronounce it? Zanstam. Yeah, Zandam. 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 Yes. And uh, which is which is a um, a Besco, a Besco heritage site. And uh, mm-hmm. which has five, I believe, five well-preserved windmills, and uh, they're beautifully painted. They're green and uh, beautiful water scene. And and it, I remember it was really <laughs> cold that day. You and I went out, and mm-hmm. uh, I think we were both bundled up, and the winds were blowing, and we were on top of a bridge and holding onto our canvases. And <laughs> and uh, yeah. it, it was fascinating to watch you paint. I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, I love your paintings. I love the fact yeah. that. You're very, um, very abstract uh, in the in your approach, and you use a lot of really a lot of thick paint, and really uh, I think muted colors, and yet they don't read as muted colors when you view them. What's Thank your you. what, What's your philosophy on painting? Uh, I think color is everything. That's number one, and um, there are more painters like me saying this. I think this is the absolute truth. Um, it's not about the line. It's not about the detail. It's not about the knife or the brush. It is only about color. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what do you do differently with your colors? Because I, I noticed first off, you mix up big piles of color. That was one of the first things I saw you do. And and when I say big piles, we're talking about big piles because <laughs> you you use a lot of paint. Um, yeah, when I go uh, six days to uh, paint abroad, I probably end up using uh, a kilo of white. That's a kilo. <laughs> a kilo. <laughs> yeah, three tubes, two hundred millimeter. Yeah, maybe. Now nah, maybe that's half a kilo. All right. Yeah. Well, half a kilo. Then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So tell me about how this painting thing all started for you. Okay. Um, yeah, I've I've always known that I wanted to be a painter, but I was afraid to end up on a attic room somewhere, being all alone, doing my painting thing. Uh, so I studied graphic design first uh, to uh, make a living. But uh, luckily, I quickly found out that uh, I could make a living painting and that I also had to decide to give up the uh, graphic part to uh, have the 100% of time. So how how long ago was that? Um, this was about 1997. Yeah. Oh. And uh, then I still was a studio painter. And um, I also did a lot of portraits and decors for theater and uh, wall paintings in uh, stores. Yeah. And, and in 2002, I, I abandoned all the studio work and I fully committed to uh, plein air painting. So that's about, what, 14 years now? Yep. So you don't do any studio work at all anymore? No. And oh, no commissions, no more. It is so freeing to uh, close that door forever. <laughs> Tell me yeah. why. Um, freedom is everything, just like colors are and sky. Uh, freedom is everything and... Um, you probably end up feeling miserable doing commissions some way or yes, some moment or another, some way or another, you always be not totally doing what you should be doing, I think. So it bothered you to do commissions because you weren't painting what you loved or what you wanted to do? Mm. It's little incidents, people saying, well, fix this nose, please. And you do, you commit again a few hours to it and uh, you don't get a thank you. This is one example. And for me, this is, the, you know, this is, uh, yeah, this is not the way I want to do my job or yeah. my, my work. Yeah. So uh, what's, you, you do only plein air paintings. Do you, yeah. do you do anything really large or do you keep everything relatively small? <laughs> I try, but um, I don't like it as much, the big ones. Maybe 
when I see this woman, uh, she lived in the desert. You remind me, please. I forget her name all the time. She she doesn't live anymore, unfortunately. You know, with the big pickup truck and the easel stuck to the back. I don't know who you're talking about. I'm sorry. Uh, in the area of Phoenix, maybe. But, oh, really? Um, okay. If I if I see videos of her, I know I can do it, or I love it, and I want it, but I don't have this uh, f- totally figured out yet. So I need to sort of control the smaller size still. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, the galleries are whining about why can you not paint bigger? But I'm always thinking, is it because it's more profit for them or because it's more important? I don't know, you know. So maybe later. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And and, uh, how many paintings do you think you produce in a year? It was more. Now I spent more time in the marketing end. Um, maybe, yeah, nor, uh, in the year, uh, five years before, I did maybe 200 a year, maybe more. And now it's about maybe 150, maybe less. Uh-huh. And, and yeah. what percentage are you selling? Um, normally it was about 80%. Uh-huh. But I've seen sales go down the last two years. And, uh, yeah, so um, I think um, uh, maybe 60. Yeah. 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 So why do you think sales have gone down? Uh, Facebook, email. Yeah. Uh, Email doesn't have the same open rates. Facebook, of course, has all changed. So we need to all change the strategies quickly. And um, I'm fussing with this now and learning and finding new ways. Also, I've uh, upped the prices. So normally a lot of artists would buy my stuff, but I think they don't have the money anymore. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So I need to somehow attract a better or, yeah, you know. I could, I could, ri- pro- I could probably or... give you the name of a couple of magazines that a lot of collectors read, but uh, we won't get into yeah. that right now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, also targeting, yeah. yeah. Uh, the whole targeting with the Facebook ads needs to also shift perhaps. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, that that's a whole nother discussion. And that is that yeah. you um, you and I share a, um, a person that we follow a lot uh, who is a kind of a marketing expert. And um, uh, we've we've been able to um, share some things that, that we've learned together. And I think you do an excellent job in your marketing. And, and you know, it it is a constant battle. I think what you just talked about, I, I think it's important for everybody to understand, and that is that things are constantly changing. Yeah. And if you have uh, the, the expert that we both follow, uh, if says that if you have all of your eggs in a single basket, let's say um, email, for instance, um, mm-hmm. then, uh, you know, if something happens where open rates um, don't don't occur anymore, or you get blacklisted on a spam list, yeah. uh, you're dead in the water. Mm-hmm. This particular guy talked a lot about, um, back in the day, he used to do a lot of these infomercials on television, and then uh, literally one day to the next, the, the government changed the law, and it essentially killed that business. Yeah. And he had all of his eggs in that basket and completely had to reinvent. And so what, you know, what he talks about and what you and I have talked a lot about is the importance of having our marketing based in multiple areas so that we don't have uh, everything in one particular area because, you know, it inevitably, you know, a lot of people are using Facebook right now. Um, some success, some successfully, some not, but inevitably, uh, you know, that's going to change. Uh, I mean, look at MySpace 10 years ago, it was hot and then boom, it was gone. And though nobody anticipates that that could happen with Facebook, of course, anything could happen. Regulations can happen. Changes can happen. So something, yeah. something newer, hotter, better. So Yeah, we always need to keep learning, keep learning, keep uh, sort of digesting the info, 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 and also uh, implementing it uh, almost straight away because if you don't, you forget – so and, um, what, what percentage yeah. of your time do you spend on, on marketing your products? 
maybe 65 percent really yeah, people yeah people are uh, terrified <laughs> hearing this but uh, yeah, yeah. It is well, I think what's interesting, if if you go to your website, which is what is it, Rosesherling dot com? Yeah, without the L. I hear you pronounce an L somewhere. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. So it's R O O S S S C H U R I N G dot com. What what I think is pretty interesting, unlike most artists, um, you're really offering a lot of different things. I uh, I bought a painting from you, and you. Um, I I was really impressed because when the painting came, first off, the mm -hmm. tape that was around the box had your logo all over it, and I opened it up, and there was um, I think there was a calendar of paintings. Um, you know, you really are a good marketer, and and you're trying to recycle people into additional things uh you go to your website and you're offering uh things other than paintings they're all based on your paintings how do those yep. things do for you uh very well uh but it's not about the profit margin there yeah of course uh, it's also lead uh, generating um things huh? okay so let's talk uh, about that because a lot of people don't understand that lead generation is essentially um you know trying to get names right so yeah um, yeah if if everything crashes down around us we need to have the full addresses and uh, what better way to get those um, than by uh, having these come from paying customers so um i'm sort of experience experimenting with uh, uh, cheap products to build a list and, and I think that's very important. I was thinking this morning about advertising. And, and you know, um, a, a lot of people, when they advertise, they, they look at advertising as a way to generate sales for paintings. And I think that's the wrong thing they should be thinking about. Now, obviously, it ultimately comes down to that. But what really should be yeah. happening, and it should be happening simultaneously, I mean, you can be working to sell paintings, but you also should be working to get uh, an email address yeah. and use that email address as a means of offering something that you can then get a, a physical address so that you can get people into a system of marketing uh, so that you yeah. have building relationships, building relationships yeah. and frequent content. I just launched a product called Art Marketing in a Box because so many artists aren't like you. Uh, they are, they're you know, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to market. So we yeah. basically created a product that has a checklist that says, do this this month. Yeah. It gives them all the products. It's already designed and laid out. And all they got to do is put their artwork in and their image and, yeah. and uh, their name. And um, so th those kinds of things, then, if, if your advertising is, is not only generating interest in your painting and your advertising is also building your name, your brand, which is basically building trust that you're going to be yeah. around and trust that you're important as a painter, uh, that ultimately sells paintings. But th those things take time. Those are things that build on one another. Yeah. But if you offer uh, something, for instance, in your ad that says, you know, I'll give you a, a, a free ebook of my 50 best paintings or my 20 best paintings or my philosophies on art or, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. then you're getting them into the system. And you're doing a lot of that kind of thing, aren't you? Yeah, and there's more coming. <laughs> I'm uh, working yeah, behind the scenes at a big, big thing. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting that you say that your painting sales have gone down, and yet yep. you're you're one of the hardest working mark marketing, yep. uh, hardest working sure. marketers that I know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, and you're spending sixty or sixty percent of your time yeah. on it. So, I, I think that in spite of that, I think you know what would have happened if you weren't doing all this marketing. Uh, and, and I would and, be uh, working at a uh, grocery store. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. really that's really critical to have control over your marketing and to be doing it and to be consistent about yeah. it and and also to understand that um, you know not everything lasts forever, but yeah. sometimes they'll and come to, back. So you got to keep marketing. Yeah. 
and to also accept it that there is no one way that will stay okay forever and that there is no system that doesn't need changing or there's no one way yeah there's only one way that's forward people don't know people often stand still not knowing what to do but they better start moving no matter what direction start doing stuff taking but action we also have to realize that a lot of people a lot of artists don't want to make money necessarily but the problem is that because they don't need the money they also do not self promote so it's it's also the then the attention that they are not getting uh, the fame that they are not getting the respect that they are not getting and ultimately i don't want my paintings to be burned because people don't know the value and if you want your paintings to survive you you'll need to create fame this is what i believe well you know a lot of people are uh, are, are really turned off by that whole concept i i got criticized for writing a post about yeah. in my blog about the importance of celebrity yeah. And and I, I think that the the first thing we we need to do when it when it comes to marketing is we have to understand everything has to be done ethically. It's not yeah. about manipulation. It's about ethically. No. But you have a responsibility as a painter to help people learn about you. Uh because that you know, otherwise I mean it's okay to do it for yourself, but uh, and and it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's important to paint what you love and what you want to paint, and not not be influenced by marketing per se. Uh, I I know you and I had a big discussion when we were out there about how you paint what you love. You're not going to paint what other people want you to paint just because it sells. Yeah. Never. Yeah. But so I rather I rather be poor. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. marketing is an opportunity to help you. Let others yep. know about you, and it's a responsibility, yeah. and it's it's a never-ending process. Yes, Eric, and also I recently had um, a very, let's say, older guy in my feedback thing in an online painting course, and he was creating such beautiful paintings that I was saying, it is a shame that you don't share this with the world because... Uh, yeah, you're recording or you're registering beauty of nature and you don't let other people enjoy it so it can be spread through, yeah, over the world and be saved for later yeah, times, huh? So, um, but people often don't see it like this. They, But I told him, uh, let your cousin, neighbor, whoever make you a website, make build you a shop, let people buy it. You cannot keep it, or, yeah, holding on to it, or yeah, yeah. I I said also, you don't have the eternal life. Nobody does. Yeah. Well, you so know, yeah. if, if 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 you've spent your life developing a talent, why not share it with others? And and you know, yeah. my philosophy on this is that you you were given this this opportunity, and yeah. it's Talents. it's important to be able yeah. to share it. And yeah. and um, so what what is the the learning process that you take your students through? Um, I have gone through it, but now I sort of start to think that it's maybe lacking enough psychology because you can offer people um, all the help they need, all the steps they need, but if they deep down think that they are afraid to fail, then, yeah, obviously, uh, I am not successful offering anything. So um, I do think that I need to sort of spend more time thinking, how can I take this fear of failure out of the whole equation? But that, means, that will mean that I need to sort of change these people. And uh, I still have not figured this out, maybe with little tasks, they can be happy with little accomplishments more quickly because when the accomplishments are too big and they think they fail, uh, they feel bad and then everything else is lost. 
Well, you know, yeah. I had I, I had a guy that trained me many, many years ago. His name was Jack Jackson. Um, he had studied under uh, Ives Gamel and Frank Riley and uh, Senorita Simi in Florence. And he would tell us that we get too invested in what we're painting, that we get too tied together with it. We fall in love with what we've done. And we would spend weeks sometimes on a big painting and he would just come over and scrape it down and, and, and you know we were we were frustrated about it and i remember one lady in the class literally flipped out started crying went nuts and left and never came back but but he he made the point he said look your your job is to get it right and not to not to fall in love with it and you know scrape it down yeah. and get it right do it right again because yeah. if, if, you know, if you don't get it right, you don't learn to get it right, uh, then you're going to have a problem forever. And, and Richard Schmid talks a lot about the first part of his career. He, would, he spent a lot of time correcting errors. And now he tries to get everything perfect the first time so that he doesn't have to go back in and redo it, which burns a lot of time. So I, I think one of the ways, certainly I don't know if that overcomes fear of failure, but I think we all need to understand that it's 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 not something you have to be emotionally invested in. You can go back in and, and you want to be emotionally invested in getting yeah. a good painting, but you, you don't want to fall in love with what you've done. You want to you want to yeah. keep going until you get it right. Yeah. Yeah, I do have one tactic that seems to work. What's that? And that is that I have this exercise where I say, um, okay, set a number, a goal of the amount of paintings you want to have done by this or that date. Then divide this number by the uh, amount of weeks. Then you know how many you need to create each week. And then you have to have a goal with this work. You will have to scout out locations and then take three or one or two, preferably one or two, and go go here uh, in these weeks again and again and again and again until you have this number accomplished. And with this number of paintings, you can create maybe a book, one theme, one subject. Uh, this is also how you uh, kill the I don't want to paint today thing. And this is also how you stop the question, where will I go? What size should I take? What should I paint today? It is all fixed. And within this, you can vary uh, seasonal changes, weather changes, hour changes. Yeah. So then you have a, a, a sort of series and a goal. This is how you get better quickly. You have to control one scene at a time. Also with the sunscapes, yeah, the sun rises. Uh, I think the first 10 were awful. And then you have to just proceed, 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 change, 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 and make new plans. Come back, come back, come back, again, again, again. Yeah, but most people are not so maybe obsessed or dedicated Unfortunately, if they were, they were getting better painters very quickly. Hmm? Very rapidly. Yeah, yeah I, I have. Uh, uh, I've often thought that that one thing that would be a really great training exercise is to is to uh, ha hold a workshop in a place that's not beautiful, and you know, go in a back alley and say, "Okay, we're going to stop right here and paint," and you know, mm -hmm. just you know, figure out how to make beauty out of something. And then, you know, paint it a couple of times and a couple of times more because it, it gives you that opportunity to go, wait, how do I make these garbage cans look nice? And, mm. uh, you know, there's, a, there's also another yeah. disease. Um, somebody, uh, somebody has a name for it. I can't remember what they called it. But I, I was in, um, in Florence uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, I got a car and I, was, I had this scene in my mind that I wanted to paint and I ended mm -hmm. up driving around for eight hours <laughs> looking for that scene. And I, you know, I'd passed by about 30 other places I could have painted. Yeah. And, and uh, so sometimes you just got to settle and, and just get, get busy. Uh, yeah. 
So yeah, that is true. Sometimes the play, the spot you're looking for, um, would be on the first exit anywhere. Yeah. But yeah, better to be. I painted. know the feeling, and often, uh, yeah, often it's with very beautiful places that you have the most problems deciding where to go. Because there's so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I, I really find it fascinating the way you paint. You, you're very direct. <clears throat> you, um, you're not doing any sketching. You're not doing any underpainting. You're just going in and, and you're laying in thick paint. And you've, I, I've seen you paint very rapidly. As a matter of fact, I think you did two paintings in the time I did one when we were on the bridge. Nah, not, not always. I do that rapidly. Yeah. So that's, but, that's a uh, misperception. No, I, I don't care about the speed. Uh, yeah. Of course, when you have a deadline because you need to bring the kids to school and you want to paint before uh, their school begins, that's it's often very good to have the deadline or you have to pick them up because otherwise I'll probably screw it up too, painting too long sometimes. Um, but and about the underlayer, I sometimes do use underlayers colored in the colored gesso uh, or. Yeah, the uh, acrylics that are high quality, and I scrape them off real thin. Um, that helps, yeah. That's also uh, what but Kevin McPherson uh, teaches. Yes, the design stage is you're very not important. Painting, so, you're not painting in acrylics uh, overall, though, right? You're painting in, in oils, but you're putting acrylics on as underpainters? Is that yeah, right? gesso is a form of acrylic, so you just need a good acrylic and do it real thin and you probably cannot do this on a too flat surface you need to have some kind of canvas surface with tooth to uh, yeah otherwise the oils will fall off yeah if it's too thick you cannot do that um yeah the speed um yeah moments change fast so the more speed you can have the better but of course you need to pay attention again uh, to what you're painting yeah, if you're too slow, then you probably miss the first thing you saw. Yeah, especially, for example, when sunrise painting, it's so fast, everything going by. Or in the morning, from darkness to light, it's every minute it changes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, obviously, there are people who would argue that that slowing down is better. It's it's really just a personal preference, I know. Now, I also slow down in the midst of haste. Yeah? Yeah. So, so, so what is the key? Uh, let's talk about creating a sunrise painting or a sunset painting because you, you really only have about two to three minutes of, of that spectacular color when the sun is at that exactly right spot and the colors are hitting the clouds, it's, it doesn't usually last very long. Is, do you have a, a process that you go through when you're, when you're doing something where the, the light's going to change that dramatically? Mm, the process would be that you uh, go to the spot before you see anything, of course. Yeah, otherwise you would miss it. And you don't have time to put up the easel, set up the easel. So... You have to travel in darkness to maybe find the sunrise, yeah? Because sometimes there's just no sunrise because it's all gray. And um, Especially where you live. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's always different. So I'm always hoping for a red one. I love the red one. And... Yeah, you, you often get it wrong or you think I should have toned down all colors because now my sun is not shining or um, why did I put my horizon so high uh, or why did I not um, start this or this way or yeah. I think you also need to be a good memory painter when you are a planner painter. So how do you train? Uh, how do you train yourself to be a good memory painter? Uh, you will become one, I think. Yeah, I think we we just need to face the fears and go anyway. Yeah, I don't know how to explain it. 
um, be prepared to fail and then you will find the real gems you know do, do you, you, you never know in advance I, I think that's pretty important to to say again is be prepared to fail so yeah. do you if you're going in to to do a sunset or a sunrise do you kind of sketch in the landscape first so that you can get the the basic elements that you see in there and then you drop the yeah, light in I, I, on top of it the whole canvas needs to have some kind of paint on in order to smear yeah the right word uh, uh when it's time to and uh re to put in the sun you also need to have all colors down uh maybe mixtures made i sometimes pre-mix colors at home so I already have a little bit of sky colors ready. And uh, it's important you uh, make the whole landscape pretty dark to have the real uh, good value there. So it's not and, necessarily about paint what you see because, you know, if you're, you're, you might be making the, the foreground darker, the sky darker. No, so, I no? need to be there. If I if I would be doing it in here, it would be guessing. It would be awful. No, I'm not. So I'm not suggesting there. that. What I mean yeah. is, what I mean is that you know that the light's going to glow more if the surroundings are the yeah. con is there's more contrast. It's darker. So yeah. if if it's not as dark as you see it, you're painting it darker just so that the sun will pop out more. Is that right? Yeah, and this is what you learn when you go there again and again and again and again. Every time you go there, you will learn about three or maybe five things, and which three you will forget again, two you will remember. And these are taken into account for the next time. So after 50 times, you have a baggage full of wisdom uh, that will, you know, guide you again through it. Um, yeah, and yeah. this cannot be learned from my book. You will need to go there. You need yeah. to go there. So yeah. um, I, I'm curious about inspirations in terms of painters from the past. Um, you know, when we think of holland we think of vermeer and rembrandt but mm -hmm. uh the the whole 19th century dutch thing is not very well known and there were some absolutely incredible landscape painters uh, are there any ones in particular that really turned you on and that our our listeners might uh want to google and see if they can learn something about them yes um they might want to google rulofs that is r-o-a L O F S and then painter or schilder. <laughs> and um Can you say that again. There, R O L No R O E L O F S Rolofs. Yeah, and <laughs> is that the first and, or um, the last name? First and, or last name? Uh last name. Okay. I, I believe it's William the first, but I don't know for sure. All right. I've never heard and, that name. Yeah, very important name. <laughs> and uh, then there's Weissenbruch. Maybe you heard of him, yes. Uh, nope. W-E-I-S-E-N-B-R-U-C. Um, yeah, double S, I think. Weissen, uh, Weissenbruch. B-R-U-C-H? Yeah. Okay. Terrific painters. All right. Uh, of course, Rembrandt is great because of his sketching and handwriting. Um, we, who else is there? Of, of, of course, Van Gogh, but yeah, yeah. We, you all know them. Yeah. Um, who else is there? Yeah. You know, I like looking at books, but I'm not practicing learning how to paint on a sort of daily basis, except for going out there. Yeah. Well, so. that's the best way, isn't it? I'm also on Facebook. I'm not necessarily interested in painting. I'm more interested in business stuff. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. So uh, you're going to be on stage at the plein air convention in San Diego in April. What are you going to do? Um, I want to show tricks. Uh, I will probably make a sort of top 10. Okay. And, top, uh, top 10 tricks. Yeah. And it will be about light. I think uh, light and color uh, need to be addressed uh, or is something that people probably will like. And um, 
I will do a short top 10 and maybe uh, then paint it so as an example. Yeah. So uh, there will be great stuff in there. I hope it will be recorded and that I can have the recordings also put later <laughs> in the courses. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll talk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then you're going to be out in the field uh, working with people when we go out painting every day. You'll be out there and, and giving advice and setting up and yeah. painting. And I'm sure you're anxious to paint uh, San Diego where Very. we actually have sunshine. Um, yeah, yeah. You probably and I don't. I want to ask you, Eric. Do we need to go all the way to the uh, to the west to the uh, what is the name Sunset Cliff, or is this too far to drive? No, no, it's Where not. You... It's not far at all. We have we have four painting locations that we're going okay. to announce when we get there, and okay. Sun Sunset Cliff happens to be one of them, and it's a fabulous place. And yeah. you get there in that afternoon, pink afternoon light. It oh. is just glowing. Yeah. So, I love California. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, uh, well, I, we're excited about you coming all the way across the pond to um, to be there with us at the Plein Air Convention this coming April. And um, uh, I hope people will look at your website, which is rosshuring.com, R-O-O-S. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, of course, uh, we'll, we'll try to figure out some ways to make it uh, – so that people can see your work, um, you know, on the website for the plein air convention and so on. But in, any final thoughts for people before we part? I wanted to thank you very much for uh, letting me come there. Uh, I'm so honored and so happy that I can be there as a Dutch painter. Uh, and among these great painters, I'm so happy to meet uh, all these people and, Many of uh, who I spoke to on e via email, yeah, finally, finally meeting them in person. I probably will make photos of everyone I meet and then have these photos written on with their name to not forget <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I'm also uh, whatever 42 now, so oh, the whole come memory on. thing. Well, the whole memory you're, thing you're, is going you're down. Trying down to down. say that your yeah. memory is slipping at 42, <laughs> yeah, it uh... is, yeah. All right, you're gonna. I'm gonna have to have a talk with you about that. All right, I'm very well, happy to meet you, Eric, and um, I hope we have very good times. And uh, yeah, it's too short, too short. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. we're we're gonna have a great time together. Um, I, I absolutely love your painting style, and I have uh, your painting hanging right here um, in in the headquarters of the. Plein Air magazine, so I'm I'm excited so to uh, to look at it every day, and it's inspiring to me, and I think to other people, and I I just love the the way that um, y you know I I'm learning this is not necessarily true in all cases, but I I am learning that it's that that color actually looks brighter and more uh, pronounced when things are more muted. And uh, mm -hmm. when things are grayed down and, and uh, you know, it seems counterintuitive, but you, you seem to be the master of that. You're really, really Mwah. beautiful at that. So. <laughs> now, I would say the Russians master it probably even more. But I think we all need to uh, love, uh, try to love ourselves or our own work. And you should do it too, Eric. And everybody listening should do it too. Maybe Absolutely. stop stop looking too much at other people's, you know, things and try to love what you do and love your mistakes and mistakes is what makes a painting great. And, um, don't scrutinize your paintings. I cannot look at them, you know, 24 seven. So I put everything away, most everything. And, um, I, oh yeah. The thing I also want to mention was that, it's so important to always think there's always tomorrow. I will return tomorrow. I will return next week. I will return in three days, in two days, in one day. And I will just do it again, 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 and again. And uh, within this pile of paintings, you will find your gems. And, and that's worth everything. Well, I think you yeah. said you said something that I think is very critical, and that is putting things away. You know, when yeah. you, you get very invested in them when you paint them. And uh, after they dry, throw them off in a pile somewhere and, and then pull them out a few months later and look at them. You'll see them completely differently. You'll see things yeah. that you didn't even realize were in your painting or, or things that, that 
um, you know, make the composition better or worse. Uh, you know, it's, it, and I learned that trick from a fellow by the name of Fred Picker, who's mm. a, a photographer who studied with Ansel Adams, who told him that. And, and he goes out and he's not alive anymore, but he would go out and, and photograph things. And then he would not develop, he would develop the film, but then he wouldn't print the pictures for a year. And then he would wow. print them and then he put them away for another year. And then he'd decide <laughs> which ones he was going to market. So yep. interesting. Uh, obviously, Very, we don't all have yeah, that much we could, time. We could go on and on. Uh, thank you for everything you do for other painters. Oh, you're very and, welcome. Uh, I hope you get enough rest as you're doing everything and help. And um, <laughs> yeah, and I hope you paint also with us. Then I'll be painting with you, and and my okay. motto is rest when you're dead. There's too much to do. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> All right, yeah. Rose, uh, thank you so much, and, and uh, we will see you in April at the Plein Air Convention. Thank you so much, Eric. Bye-bye. Well, thanks again to Rose Schuring. Uh, this interview was sponsored by the Plein Air Convention held this April in San Diego. Uh, some of the most amazing artists in the world are the faculty to teach you, whether you're a beginner or you're just learning to paint or you're an experienced pro. It's an amazing event. We go outdoors to paint every day, and if you're uncomfortable with that, you can just come and watch but we'd love for you to paint too. We don't care if you can paint very well. You're going to learn to paint well, that's for sure. We have instruction indoors on four stages with big screens so you can see every detail and a giant expo hall of goodies of art supplies. You can learn more at plenairsalon.com. Today's interview is sponsored by the Easel Brush Clip. It's just what it sounds like, a clip that holds your brushes so they're not falling on the ground. They're easy to find. Watch the video at easelbrushclip.com. Also, I want you to know the Plein Air movement is red hot, which may be why Plein Air magazine remains the top-selling representational art magazine on the newsstands nationwide at Barnes & Noble. We're very proud of that. Thank you for making that happen. Drop by, pick one up for yourself, or get a bi-monthly subscription for half the price of the newsstand at plenairmagazine.com. This is always fun for me. Let's do it again sometime like next week. We will see you then. I am Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. Remember, it is a big, big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye.